Looks like he's it's after we not bad. Uh, so now we're going to R and two weeks of pipe and uh, learn there. So Andrew Lutz is giving the talk today. Actually, before we start talking about how to install Python, I'm just going to show you guys where all the materials are located in case you need to uh, reference them or you want to open it up and follow along. Uh, it's for the, They're all located in the Google Drive and also on Bitbucket. So in the Google Drive, uh, so far all of them are in presentations and then Python. And then there's a couple notebooks here. I have HTML versions of the notebook. If you open these up in Drive, it won't make sense, so you'll need to download them and open them with your mm -hmm. browser. Um, I might later try to get some PDF versions of the notebook. It's pretty much just a version of the notebook you could view, but you cannot interact with. And then you can see the presentation here. They're also on Bitbucket and the G-Time repository for those of you who have forked it. So before you start using Python, it helps to install it. So that's the first thing we're going to go over. And for this class, uh, it seems like a good idea to install the Anaconda distribution because it has everything we will need. So what the Anaconda-based distribution is, is it's a bunch of packages and a package manager, to put it simply. So it includes most of the uh, popular Python packages, including, I think, everything we'll be using here. Um, it uses the Conda package management system, so if you need to get another package, um, I'll show you the command for that, but there's also a lot of other things you could do. And Anaconda is the distribution of Python that we've installed on the VUV Lab and the Open Data Science VDIs here on campus. Mm -hmm. And it's open source software, so it's free. And some of the notable packages that we'll be using are IPython, Jupyter, Matplotlib is for plotting, NumPy. Well, we'll discuss some of these. Well, we'll discuss all of them in more detail. NumPy is for arrays, pandas is for data frames like they are in R. This is just a language version. Uh, we're going to be using Python 2.7. I'll discuss that more on the next slide. And then scikit image and scikit learn. Hopefully, we'll have time for those, but I'd like to at least get the other stuff first. Then SciPy is all the your scientific Python computing needs, and spiders and IDE. So to install Anaconda, you go to the web page for installing it, and you pretty much just follow the directions. I'm not going to go through it specifically because it's different for each operating system. For Windows, there's a graphical installer. Make sure you do Python 2.7 instead of 3.5. For OS UX, you have an option between graphical and command line. And for Linux, it's just a command line. So it takes a while to install. You don't have to do it right now. I would suggest you do it sometime before tomorrow's class. Today I will be showing just the basics of Python, but uh, the notebook is in the uh, G time repository and it's also on uh, Google Drive. But also, if you don't have access to Google Drive, I think Ethan is the owner and he can give you access, so you want to talk to him properly. So, the reason we're using Python 2.7 instead of 3.5 is because, one, it's the version we have on um, a lot of our resources, and two, there's more packages available for it. There's not a massive, massive difference between the two versions, and one of the nice things about Anaconda is you could actually create a Python 3.5 environment with 2.7 or the other way around. So as long as you have one of them installed, you could use the other one anytime you want to. And uh, like 
I said, there's not a whole lot of huge differences, but there are, are a few small things that might give you problems if you don't know about them. So I'll try to teach as many of those as are really relevant. So Python in general, the language is actually, compared to something like Java or Bash, it's actually fairly similar to R. It just has different capabilities in some areas, and it's more widely used than R. So if you have questions about Python, it's usually pretty easy to Google them, and you'll find an answer. It might not be the right answer, but you will find an answer probably. <laughs> This is uh, how you install a package with the Conda Package Manager. It's just this line. So if you're in Linux or uh, Mac, you you uh, type that under terminal. In Windows, you can either use git bash if you have it installed, or I think it's called the command prompt. And this will work on any of those. And that'll just uh, install whatever package you find you need that isn't in a hand Conda. So in this uh, class, when I'm teaching at least, I'll probably jump right into the uh, IPython notebook, also known as the Jupyter notebook. I'll probably just refer to it as the notebook so there's not really any confusion. And that uses IPython. Uh, the reason I'm using it this way is because I think it's easier to learn Python in that environment rather than just in like a terminal or something like that. And so, before we, we're not really using an IPython terminal or console in the class, but I thought I should definitely at least tell you guys what it is so you'll recognize the elements of IPython when we start using the notebook. It's short for interactive Python, and it pretty much um, just makes Python nicer and easier to use. It's developed as a sub-project of Jupyter. It, it's inspired by Mathematica. MATLAB. So a lot of the nice features from there are included in IPython. It adds a graphic user interface like capabilities to just typical going line by line of the terminal. And here's a few things that it can do for you, like adding figures, it highlights the syntax so you know what are um, like, should include the global functions and such. And there's also tab completion, which is really nice. Um, it's easy to find documentation. We'll sh I'll show some of this when we get into the notebook. And you could access the uh, shell, like if you want to change directory in a Linux environment, all you have to do to run commands like that is put a exclamation point, otherwise known as a bang, in front of the command and it'll pass it to the shell instead of ex trying to execute it in Python. And then there's more information for that on the sleep. So this is almost some of the most confusing parts I found in Python were why, why did they talk about Python 2.7 versus 3.5 because they're like completely different languages, you have to choose one or the other. And then two, how do you work with Python? Because there's also an idle shell. There's You can do it at the console, idle, IPython consoles, IPython notebooks, now called Jupyter Notebook. There's so many different ways you could approach doing Python. It's almost hard to choose one and start. Yeah, you could just start with scripts like we did with R. And uh, we're probably also very likely to go over the spider IDE. So for those of you who haven't noticed, if you've got a fork of the uh, G-Time repository, there are probably a few common commits behind, so you could go ahead and sync that. Mm -hmm.
see there's a few things that I haven't added. This mm -hmm. one yet. And on this environment, uh, I've already installed the Anaconda, so pretty much the only thing you need to do to run the notebook is type in either git bash or if it's a, some sort of terminal or like I said, Windows command line, just type the words Jupyter with a Y and then space notebook. And it's uh, browser based, so it should open in Chrome. It takes a little while to start, not too long usually. So this is the um, same directory I was in when I launched it. So what you want to make sure you do is launch it in a directory above wherever your IPython notebooks are. Otherwise it might be uh, difficult to run them. This is just sort of like an uh, interface for going through your files. So in the repository it's similar topics and then Python. And since we're already in Jupyter, we could just go ahead and open up the uh, notebooks. Mm. So this is what a IPython notebook looks like, or Jupyter notebook, IPython notebook, this is called a notebook. It's similar to our markdown because it combines documentation with uh, code. Uh, it's useful for teaching and learning because it's very easy to look things up and it's very easy to go back and uh, if you get an error you know what it's from and it's split into different cells there's various types of cells uh, this cell here is a markdown cell that's why it looks nice if you double click on it it actually shows what all the input from the markdown cell is and then this cell below is, um, this is a code cell. You use the pound or hashtag or whatever you want to call it to make a comment, just like in R. And then there's several shortcuts for running cells. There's a lot of, uh, there's a little button here that sort of looks like a little keyboard. And it will tell you all the shortcuts that are available. So. Pretty much everything there's a shortcut for, you could also click and do them somewhere in here, but it's just easier, especially if you're running a whole bunch of code at once. Mm -hmm. So the two big ones are shift enter, will run the current cell and move to the next one, and control enter runs the current cell but does not move to the next one. Shift enter also creates a new cell if there is no next one, and I think the default is a new code cell. If you want to change the cell, there's a little drop down menu here, so I could change it to markdown or back to a uh, code cell. And uh, markdown will be, well, I, it will probably be covered as a separate topic. Um, yeah, during the lab tech week. But we haven't gotten to that yet, so there should be a. Uh, a cheat sheet somewhere. And that should be in the readings folder of your uh, repo? Well, I also created okay. a, my own cheat sheet, although mm -hmm. it's not showing up here, which is interesting because it's on the master branch. And basically, it's just a whole bunch of stuff that you could double click on and look through. Gonna open up the Jupyter notebook in the master branch because I know it has everything. So to close Jupyter notebook, you just do Control C twice.
had trouble logging into Bitbucket because my password <laughs> is an M in it. I would press it several times and I had to watch whether a character showed up or not. Ah. Yeah, here's the uh, cheat sheet. It's basically just a whole bunch of basic things you can do. If you double click on it, you can see all the uh, markdown stuff that makes it look nice. So any time you need something that has the basic stuff, um, you could also use LaTeX to uh, make equations look nice, which I will do a little bit, not very heavily. That will also be a topic that will be covered later. So let's go back to this notebook. Oh, also on Jupyter, um, there's when you open notebooks, you it starts a kernel, which is basically what all your code runs into. There's some options here, and uh, once you close the notebook, like if I just close this tab, it doesn't necessarily shut down the kernel. So if there's a running tab. And you could uh, manually shut them down if you want. But uh, closing the notebook automatically does that. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the shortcuts are all in here. Going back to that topic. This is mostly the same stuff I said before about the similarities between Python and R. For this class, I will assume that you have at least a little bit of background in R or some other programming language, so I won't go over the basics of programming logic or anything like that. I'll just go, I'll just show you how to do things that should be more or less familiar with you in Python. Like today, for example, or if we have time, it's all in this first notebook is sort of the topic is just basic Python, it's uh, if statements, mm -hmm. loops, stuff like that. Some things in Python, most things in Python are as intuitive as they possibly can be for a programming language, but occasionally you come across something that doesn't really make sense. And generally it's a good idea to keep track of your object types. For example, when I run this cell, 6 divided by 2, you get the answer you think is obvious, 3. However, when you run this cell, you get 0. And that's because these are both integers, so you use this integer division here. If to <laughs> fix this, this is one of the things specific to Python 2. It's not an issue in Python 2 or Python 3. Um, to fix this, you just uh, have to make one of them, at least one of them, a float. So, one way to do that is uh, you use the float command. You could also put a little dot after it, and it works with either one. To see what object type it is, you uh, there's a handy little command called type. Also, if you try something on the wrong object type, it might it will probably give you an error which tells you that it's the wrong object type. But as you can see, in this case, it's, it doesn't. This could really give you a problem, like if you got a long equation and you need to multiply it by one half, like at the beginning or end, suddenly you have an equation that's always equal to zero, and that's not very useful. So it's uh, something you should be aware of. And then if you find for some reason you want to do integer division, just use a two forward slashes instead of one. This works even on floats. So run this cell real quick, you can see that's a float. Yeah, that will give you the same answer, except the output is also a float. Uh, all basic math things like plus, minus, are pretty intuitive, same as they should be in every language, and uh, you can feel free to try them out. You can do whatever you want in your own notebook. And then exponentiation is uh, double star. So if you want to 
square something, it's double star two. And then another thing in Python, this is one of the big things in Python, that you don't have to actually learn what the names of these things are to use them, but it's nice to go back and understand what everything is. And Python have class attributes and instance attributes. So whenever you define something, like anything to the left of the equal sign here is a class attribute. Those are arbitrary, it's whatever you decide them to be. You should probably try to make it something intuitive for whatever you're using it for. And it's easier to explain what uh, instance attributes are by examples. Um, I will also start using the print function here. This is also something that's different between Python 2 and 3. In Python 2, 3, it's actually a function, so you have to put it inside parentheses. So if you want to print something, you put it inside the parentheses. In Python 2, it's a statement. So it's pretty much the same thing, except no parentheses, and you put a space there. I have a question. Um, is there an easy way to switch between Python 2 and Python 3 on the notebook? I open up the notebook that it says it's Python 3. Um, I'm not sure. I've never had That's probably because you also have Python 3 installed. Mm -hmm. So if you might be able to. I think you would need to change your environment before you open Jupyter. That would probably be one way to do it. But I haven't run into that problem yet. So here's a bunch of different um, object types. So there's the floats, or the integer, and the float, which I showed before. This is just sort of the format of the print function. If you want to print one thing, you just put it there. If you want another thing after it, you do a comma and then add the other thing. And then, so there's the integer, float, string, which is any characters, really. And you just use quotes to sort of define that. And then there's a list object, which is defined by these brackets. And there's also a tuple, which is similar. Um, we'll mostly just use lists. Tuples, there's not a huge difference. Um, the details are complicated. The biggest difference is uh, the list is mutable and the tuple is not, which means if you want to add another value in here, it's, it takes a lot less memory, whereas the tuple you might have some trouble. Now there's also a dictionary object. So those are the different types of, uh, those are the basic types of class objects, and then, or class attributes. And then there's also the uh, instance attributes. And basically the entrance instance attribute is anything that comes after the dot. So uh, there's a handy function called Dir, and it just uses parentheses for anything that goes inside the function. And it'll show you all the possible um, instance attributes for that class attribute. And usually what the uh, instance attribute is just performing some sort of operation on the class attribute. Like I have some examples here. Like, uh, as we saw above, L was our list of so 1, 2, and 3. So there's a instance attribute called remove. The instance attributes are predefined. They're not something that you just sort of make up like the class attributes are. And they all have a specific function. So if I remove that, then you see it's the same list, just without the 2. For our string, which we called S, was an A, I believe. So when I used the upper 
attribute becomes an uppercase A. And then for our tuple, maybe we want to know the index when three ones. And it tells us it's two. Um, this is also something that might not seem terribly intuitive because you say, wait a second, it's the third object in that list. Mm -hmm. and that's because in Python, the index starts at zero. So this is zero, one, and then two. And that, um, it's confusing at first, but eventually you get used to it. We'll talk about that more when we do indexing with arrays. Arrays are another type of object that uh, are you, it's essentially the object that NumPy is built around. Well, that's a whole different topic. It's the next notebook I have available. Mm -hmm. So now we'll get into basic programming stuff, loops, if statements, and functions. They should be feel familiar to anyone who's used R or any similar language, really. The concepts are the same, but the syntax for Python is different in a few ways. Um, Python uses white space for syntax instead of like brackets for functions and such. So you'll notice that pretty quickly if you use to a different uh, language. And yeah, the, he uses white spacing, so it's not optional. It sort of forces you to use at least a little bit of style, because if you don't indent, bad things will happen. Because indenting is the only way it knows what's part of the if statement loop or whatever you're using. In other languages, uh, the indent doesn't really make a difference. It's sort of optional. Are indents allowed to be two spaces, or do they have to be a tab, or do you know anything uh, about that? I, I would use a tab. Because uh -huh. Python has this odd concept of code that is Pythonic, which has to do with a lot with this white space and the general visual look of the code. They're really into. And you can get in trouble if you pretend the white space doesn't matter. Things won't work. The second thing you might notice is other languages, like if you're using and in some sort of logic statement, in Python it's just the word and. In other languages it might be, uh, I think in R it's 1A percent, in other languages it's probably 2. And the same is with words like or. And uh, IPython sort of highlights these in a different color, I believe. Yeah, it's green. Same with a lot of the other built-in and scope, um, Jack mentioned this in the R crash course. It's the same for Python as it is in R, which is everything outside of functions is pretty much inside the same scope. And when you're using the notebook, um, all the cells are in the same scope. So if I run something up here, it's also like if I define x up here, it will still be defined right here if I call it or something. So here's the same if statement. Um, it's just set x and y equal to 2. And print out this string if uh, they both are, and this one if they are not. So I'll just run that. It works as you expect. Say I change like y to 3. Now they're not looking to. And that's just what I told them to print. And if you're doing uh, multiple conditions, just use parentheses. When in doubt, just use parentheses. If you're not sure of the order of operations, it's always safe to use those. So same concept here, except we're doing more than we're doing if either of these are and x is equal to 2. So right now I said y equal to negative 1. x was set equal to 2 up here. And like I said, the scope is pretty much global. So it's still equal to 2 down here. And then here is a uh, how you 
say it's not equal to, you just put the bang or exclamation point in front of the equal sign. And then same thing here, this uh, backslash n is a uh, new line, sort of a special character. So if I didn't have that there, I would just print them both out on the same line. Like that. Mm -hmm. Alright, next we're going to do loops. These often use the range function for indexing. What the range function does is it creates a list and it accepts anywhere between one and three arguments. Um, if it's one, it's the end point. It assumes the starting point is zero. If it's uh, two, it's the start and end point. And if it's three, it's the start point, the end point, and the step. Um, like I said before, learning Python is in the notebook is easier. One of the reasons is because it's really easy to look up the documentation for functions, even functions you make yourself. Like if I want to look at range, all I do is type range and then a question mark instead of the parentheses. And when I run this cell, it will come up and show me the uh, documentation. So, like I said, there's a start, stop, and it outputs a list of managers. And there might be examples down here or something like that. So let's play around with this. Oh, by default, it does not include the last value. But it starts at zero, so when you have range 10, there are 10 values. It's not 1 through 10, but 0 through 9. So if you do range 1 through 10, there's only 8 values, and it starts at 1 instead of 0. <laughs> and this is... sort of demonstrating the indexing that this is how you uh, call an object at that index is you just put a bracket after whatever the iterable object is, if it's a list or an array, and then inside you put the uh, index. In this case, the zero index is the first value, which is A here, and the four index is the fifth value, and that's the E. Um, another built-in function is length, length, it's length pretty much, so it just returns the length of whatever object. So this is the same thing here, the length of x is 5. And it'll work on, say, strings. There's six characters here, so if I do the length of a string, it's 6. So if you have a string inside of a list, uh, you need to be careful which one you're calling the length of. So, as I mentioned before, here's the range function. It's giving you a list of 50 values. And remember, they're not from um, 1 to 50. They're from 0 to 49. And then, you might find that uh, when you're doing your loop, your object size is changing. So it might not always be 5. Say you wanted to add an f at the end of here. So you might just want to call the length when you put it into the range function. And that will give you that. And then, like I said, if you do 1 to 50, that's actually only 49. So you might be skipping your first value. You should probably be aware of that. So here's a sample loop. Um, like the if statement, you indent after the first line. And once you stop indenting, it's no longer part of the loop. Same with the if statement. And there's always a colon at the end of this line. So for i in range x, or the range and the length of x, so the range makes the list uh, 0 through 4. And it's just going to print out each one of those every time it goes through the loop. You could also do it this way. Um, X is already a list, so you could 
instead of just doing i as an index, you could use whatever the value of um, the current iteration is. So, if, so what letter is for each first iteration? It's a, the second one is b, and so on. This might be more convenient than doing something like this. <coughs> So if I run it out here, it's going to give me an error. This doesn't exist. So let's try that on. So what this does is just a simple function that sums up all the squares. So it goes through each value on the list, squares it, and adds it to um, the value that starts at 0 because well, when you haven't summed anything, you're at 0. So let's start with uh, this, another thing I should point out is this has uh, two arguments. One of them is optional. That's designated by the fact that it has an equal sign in there. So by default, it's empty. This is just an empty list. The other one is not optional. So it expects at least one argument, which is x. x is the thing it's summing. y it just prints out this statement that says your uh, second argument contains stuff. It's calling the other function inside of this function. So if I run this while, er, see the output is uh, 30, because that 
as the sum of the squares of all these numbers, and then it also prints out that statement, which it wouldn't do if I decided to not pass it y. It would also work, it just wouldn't give that statement because y to y is 0 because that's the default. Then the last thing I'm going to cover today is file IO, just the basics of it. Depending on what you want to do, it gets uh, more complicated and there's more specific uh, functions in different packages. So file IO is short for input-output, and it refers to how the language interacts with files. For example, reading data from a CSV file in R is made easy using the read.csv mm -hmm. function. And it just puts it into a data frame. Uh, in Python, the first step is you have to open the file, and this creates a file object. This is done using the open command which is a nice simple syntax. Here's, so you set it equal to whatever you want to name your file object. The file name, um, this is the name of the file. It's in the same directory as your notebook or whatever you run Python in. And you can put a whole path in there. And that would also work. And then the mode. Um, the mode, we'll talk about that down here. And then there's several different functions and even packages that involve that are involved in different ways of opening and writing files. Like there's the CSV package for opening and writing CSV files. So let's look at the documentation for this. There's file name and then the mode. I think the default is um, pretty easy to find out. And then it, it puts it into the file object. So you don't, so here's an, uh, we're going to open something called new file. It doesn't have to exist yet, necessarily, if we're opening it as, uh, we're writing it, which is what the W is. Mm -hmm. So there's R for reading it, W for write, A is for append. So if you just want to add something at the end of the file, like a new row, that's how you do that. Or R plus is for reading and writing if you want to do both. So here's just an example. You're opening the file. This is the, uh, so the type of, you set it equal to F, so F is the file object, which it says there, because I didn't have the type of object. And then that's just what the uh, file object looks like. And here's all the different things you can do with file objects. The command I mentioned earlier when going over class attributes. Um, some things are significantly more useful than others. Like, for example, here's the instance attribute write. So I'm going to write that line of text into the file. And then I can close the file. And closing is sort of like saving. And exiting the file at the same time. You need to open it anytime you want to do something to it and close it at the end. Um, so let's say we want to read the file. We open the file and read it. This is what I just put in there. It's just a little text file. And then you got to make sure you close it at the end. Uh, you can also use the with statement and that will you also need an indent for this. Um, you do with, then open, then as is pretty much your equal sign, so the file object is F again. And what the with does is, as soon as you stop indenting, it closes this file automatically, so you don't need to include this line, which can be more convenient. So uh, hmm. when you say open the file, does Python make the content of the file into memory, or Open a you just open a connection. It doesn't read or do anything until you say like if read or like write. So it'll open it on disk and lock it most probably, yeah. but not do anything. Not do anything. So this time I opened it with uh, A for append and 
then I wrote a new line and then some more text. So if we run this, it closes automatically. You can see I want to read it again, and you can see I added the other line to that file. And that would be a Pythonic style thing of the indent doing something actual. Like the indent causing the file to close. So pay attention to spacing. And I'll try to be covering as much as I can in cheat time, but I'll, it's only two weeks for an entire <laughs> language where a lot of this stuff, like I had a course just in NumPy and SciPy, which are two packages of Python. And uh, yeah, I mentioned I didn't. But this is just tea time. Continuing. And there's also uh, this link is a nice little cheat sheet of a bunch of different Python things. Uh -huh. So if you want to look at a bunch of types, here's pretty much everything I said before. There's also, and more, I just went over the basic stuff. There's also many other things you can do in Python. And there's several different topics. Um, SciPy and NumPy overlap quite a bit. We'll get into that later. That's mm -hmm. all for today. Cool.